I, Dr. Rupshika Patwari, on behalf of the Biotechnology Department, welcome you all in this August session. I express warm welcome to Professor uh, Anupam Chatterjee, Dean RSBSC, for his gracious presence. Interfaces and surfaces are where the action happens in our day-to-day -day life. To throw more light in the topic, we have amongst us eminent scientist Professor Gaurav Verma from Shan Dr. Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar University, Institute of Chemical Engineering and Technology, Punjab University. <coughs> I now would like to briefly read out the citation for Professor Verma. Professor Gaurav Verma is a professor of polymers and nanotechnology at the Department of Chemical Engineering and Technology, Punjab University, Chandigarh. He is currently coordinating the Chandigarh Region Innovation and Knowledge Cluster. Professor Burma did his Masters in Polymer Science and Technology at IIT Delhi and PhD from Punjab University. He is a postdoctoral fellow from MIT Cambridge. Some of his notable achievements are he is a recipient of Nottingham Trent University Research Grant, Go Global Exploratory Grant of British Council. He is also a recipient of Mariha Visiting Fellowship, Indian Chemical Council Recognition for Contribution to Nano Agriculture, Cash Convention Young Investigator Award from Chandigarh Science Congress. His research interests include applying nanotechnology and material science to various applications like nanocomposite coatings, agriculture, energy, and waste management. He foresees integration of nature and nanotechnology. Now, I request Professor Anupam uh, Chatterjee, sir, to kindly felicitate. So, I'm indebted to be here at this beautiful uh, campus in Guwahati. This is my first time visit to Guwahati, not Assam, because I've been to other places, but not the capital city. With the faculty, colleagues, and the students <laughs> of this beautiful university. Right. And how I'll do it is something very different because I have to talk about interface at nano scale, which is a challenge. We all know nano interface is something which you cannot see. Can you see it with a naked eye? You cannot. The smallest portion which is available for a visual confirmation is something around 150 microns if you have a 6 by 6 vision. So if you cannot see something, how will you apply it? Can somebody help me answer that question? When you can't see anything, you can't see anything, you can't see apply it. And the question is also that, whether that application will be really useful, because it is so small, that will not be useful to the general public. I think there's some students at the back. If you can come in the front, we have a lot of seats. If you can come in the front, last last rows. If you can just walk down and be here, so that I don't have to say it louder. Can you? Last from the last. Yeah, please come. Please come. Because there are a lot of images, not data or not text, which I want you to see. Okay, one of you can just walk up and come here. One of you, any one of you. Just walk up, walk up. Just tell the audience what is this. Just show the audience what is this. Everybody can see a leaf. Can I find nanotechnology in a leaf? If I cannot, then there's no point researching in nanotechnology. And when my introduction was being read by ma'am, I think she mentioned that I want an interface between nature and technology, specifically nanotechnology. Yeah, thank you. What's your name? Okay. So the first slide I'll show you here. 
is about such a leaf, not the same species, but a different species. Okay, but in the same species, which is found here, you can also find nanotechnology. How? I put a scale just below the picture. Can you see the scale? And that is why I asked you to come in the front. <coughs> Anybody can see the scale right at the back? Can you see the scale? What is the scale you can see here? Something which was visible to you when my friend, she held the leaf in her hand. 10 centimeters. Now if I have to find nanotechnology in this leaf, what do I do? What should I do? What should be the next step? I should be zooming in. That is what we do. Right? You have to zoom in at this point of focus which is called a mid rib and the side ribs in a leaf. Okay, so let's let's move ahead and try to see how it looks like. So from 10 centimeters, I go down to 1 centimeter, which is 10 raised to the power minus 2 meters. Is that okay? A valid image which we are showing? <laughs> I go a step further, try to focus in more, and I want to go to 1 millimeter. 10 is to the minus 3 meters. And how much is nano? 10 is to the minus 9. So still another minus 6. Okay. A lot of work to do. So we go ahead. I'm sorry for probably you cannot see the scale because of this. So this is 100 microns or we can say it is 10 raised to the minus 4 meters. Then we go, to, go down to 10 micron or 10 raised to the minus 5 meters and on top of every image you can also see what I am trying to show. We have got, come down to the cellular level and now to individual leaf cells. Something which is very peculiar. A leaf which was in my hand is now starting to show the real biology or the real botany behind it. All of you can appreciate that? Okay. The nucleus of the leaf cell. Right? All of the students who work on some kind of tissue will understand the importance of a nucleus. Right? And in this nucleus, the size is 10 to the minus 6 meters or 1 micron. So we are right at the edge of nanotechnology because a thousand nanometers is equal to 1 micron or 1 micrometer. Right? So you started to see or perceive what is nanotechnology now. Let's go ahead. Now what we are unveiling in these images is all nanoscale. 100 nanometers, 10 nanometers, 1 nanometer and even beyond that. The story doesn't end there. Now what do you see? What is, what is so peculiar at nanoscale now? And I promised you I will show you nanotechnology within a leaf. Have I kept my word? Yes or no? If you differ, you can say no. Then I have a right to prove again. Now anybody and all those my friends who join at the back, I am showing you nanotechnology in a leaf with these images. Now at nanoscale, can you really read what's written on the top? What is written on the top? Beyond the nucleus, we have chromatin, we have the DNA, and all these are actually building blocks of nature. <coughs> building block of any living thing. We understand how DNA is important to us, and that is why the CRISPR babies and so many things are happening around the world, and there's a lot of controversy on genetic modification. But imagine all this lies at nanoscale. 
So nature itself says that nano is my part, you should come and explore. And we are not doing it. No, this is a visualization. These are not my images. This is all visualization. Beyond picometers, we, we cannot see. But you understand, even before the atomic force microscopies and uh, electron magnification came, people could uh, come up with a quick model of atoms and other things. It's all human visualization, it's all art. So the important point here is, which I really want to highlight is that nano is actually a perception. It's all your perception how you see it. And if you're <clears throat> able to perceive it, you can really apply it. Whether it's a leaf or a human body or anywhere. Now having said that, it becomes my duty and you, please you can, you're free to ask questions in between. Stop me wherever you think you want it. So I'm just highlighting this image that the real bending blocks at one nanometer will decide how this leaf would be constructed. So God must be a nanotechnologist. So let's take it to applications directly. When you understand that a leaf or nature has nano in it, then why not apply it to plants straight away? The biggest fear with human races will not be having food security for everyone and this is one of the sustainable development goals. You know that? We are already surpassing the population of about 6 billion, right? And India is almost the most populous country. And food scarcity because of no availability of land is becoming a major challenge. So let's apply this to the agricultural application or agricultural field. So what we have done here is, and this is a part of uh, my lab research work, we have used cereal seeds and these seeds are wheat, rice and oats. Three different crops because every crop is unique. We have interfaced it with multi volt carbon nanotube which is in front of you and try to prime it and see what happens. Because we believe that the building block of nature is already nano, so why not try to reintroduce nano into the leaf from outside? So can we manipulate it without using any fertilizer or any hormones, which is the usual technique? So this is what we have done, and uh, I don't have a point of it. My arms are long enough. Inside the seed you can see a small carbon nanotube penetrated individually. And do we all know plants are much more intelligent than us? On behest of a friend, I will be able to eat or drink anything. But a plant will never accept anything which is external or foreign to it. We prefer to die rather than to thrive on something which is unacceptable to its composition. So this was our major hurdle which we overcame and see the results on your left hand side. We saw a proliferous growth of or a rich growth of rootlets. This is the next step after you have sowed your seeds. So this is what happens in a plant. There is such a dense network of roots that the plant is trying to diversify in the soil. And because of that, the germination is much faster. So what we are doing, a very small amount of multi wall carbon nanotubes. We have given to the plant, not injected. The plant has accepted it and it's tried to thrive its growth based on this. Now the story doesn't end here. Because if I tell you your food contains carbon nanotubes, you will say I don't want to eat it. So as a scientist or as a chemical engineer or as a materials engineer, our duty was to ensure and locate carbon nanotubes inside the plant. So what we have done here, in the image you see here, we have 
attached to die on the surface just like we do for satellites okay you understand payloads all the satellites go on a PSLV rocket or a GSLV depending upon where you want to place it in the orbit and that is what we did we put a die as a piggyback on the carbon nanotubes because the carbon material or the carbon element is endemic to the plant or any living thing we are all made up of carbon and hydrogen and oxygen and nitrogen and sulfur and so many other elements so how do you locate these elements inside the plant and this is how we have done it you color it and then you can find it under a confocal microscope so what we found was that in the chemical factory inside the plant I call it chemical factory because plant is able to produce its own food we are not able to do it we have to derive it from somewhere else so in the xylem and phloem or the vasculature the carbon nanotubes went and parked themselves there it did not go beyond that position and never into the grains so the edible part is the grain which we humans eat so the carbon nanotubes did not go there and apart from this we also did cytotoxicity studies which were successful and toxicologically they were found to be safe but I really don't want to go ahead with more nitty gritties that you can find in the research papers you google my name and you find the research papers but I'll treat you to some chickpea laddus ok I'll try to explain nanotechnology now with actual food ok not a leaf because I cannot eat a leaf right now so anybody can tell me here yes you have a question good can we put on this fan I cannot tell you I don't inject it I gave a disclaimer I said I we just feed it to the plant the plant takes it on its own by osmosis it's got a very thick seed coat some have a double seed coat that is why we tried on three different crops every plant is unique <coughs> no not in gulf but they enter like a, a like something foreign when, when or like a meteor enters our atmosphere it penetrates through the seed coat and that concept I'll show you for sure but it's a good question right so we really have to functionalize the carbon nanomaterials we have to make it compatible with water so water becomes a medium because plants do accept water and anything else which is foreign to it will be discarded is that clear okay coming back to this because we have to talk about surfaces and interfaces without which you really cannot get onto another application apart from agriculture so what you see here is I've tried to explain and this is probably one of the images of uh, this book which I recently came out and this has just been launched the day before I came here so February 21st is uh, the birth anniversary of Dr. Shanti Saru Bhattagar uh, under whose name the famous Bhattagar award has been instituted the highest scientific award in India so this was launched on February 21st and that is the reason why I gave the date of 22nd for traveling and today I am with, uh, with you here so this book was launched day before and one of the diagrams in this book is uh, about explaining how single atoms differ from nanoparticles so my challenge in uh, teaching engineering students and teaching students from different uh, branches is when you merge a group it becomes very difficult to translate your thoughts to that vibrant group because it's, it's so much of diversity and especially after the COVID I can see the attention span is reduced from 30 to 5 minutes or 7 minutes I can already see a lot of people winking and mm -hmm. sleeping and but I promise I, I'm going to give you something fruitful uh, so that when you go back to your hostels or 
dormitories, you don't say you wasted one hour or maybe 30 minutes or five minutes, whatever time you allow me to speak. So single atoms can be considered as one portion of your chickpea. Do you understand what's, what's a chickpea? Right? So that atom, when it is uh, put into oil, it becomes a single atom. And these single atoms, when brought together, become nanoclusters. But remember, the nanoclusters may not be as useful because they are only a conglomeration of few atoms. Right? When it turns into a nanoparticle, then you relish eating this latte. You don't want to have a half latte, you want to have a full latte. And we always say, Dusri ke thali ka laddu, achha lagta. So have it from my thali and probably you will appreciate that. So we consider nanoparticles as this full dumpling, right, which we may call in English so that uh, globally people can understand. And that is why nanoparticles are considered to be more application based. Now we have also come up with single atom therapies. Okay, mind it. So single atoms have also found their way into applications. So everybody should know. But as of now, the nanoparticles are more dominant in applications. So this is one way we have explained, or we have tried to explain in this book, how <coughs> atoms and nanoparticles differ. The second images you see here, which is uh, definitely found here because we have Brahmaputra, and on the banks you will see small pebbles or bigger boulders depending upon the trajectory of your river, wherever it goes. So everywhere the geography is different. Now tell me in these images, left or right, right at the bottom, which will have more wetting from the river on the banks? Which of the stones will be much better wetted? The ones with the smaller? or more uniform size rather than the bigger boulders. Because the bigger boulders tend to obstruct the interface between water or the waves right, with your solid stone. The liquid and the solid interface is being blocked. Can we say that? So this is another analogy which I put in the book to explain how interfaces at nanoscale are much more beneficial when it comes to realizing a real life application. Any questions on that till now? So let me shift gears. And this is our common salad. We had it for lunch. The onion peel analogy. Can you read uh, the text written here? How an onion slice, when it is chopped, or your full onion is chopped, how does it represent something from atom to a macro scale? So this is a comparison between the atomic scale and the macro scale. Can you see that? Now can you make out what, what exactly I am trying to show here? Every time I take off a P, the outer P, I am going down in size exponentially. So from a macro scale, which I was showing in terms of a leaf initially, I'm coming down to the atom scale, which is angstrom. Now there's a very famous statement in all, almost all the books and texts related to nanotechnology that surfaces <clears throat> at nano scale are much more empowered to create an interface, or surface energy is very, very high or surface is to volume ratio is much higher as compared to a macro scale. Have you heard that? You open up any text and you find the statement. But I've tried to explain it in very simple words. Now imagine I have a control center right in the middle of this onion peel. A control center. Something which wants to control the things which are moving around it and which is your electrons because you have a neutron and a proton right in the middle. Now what will happen every time I take off the peel, I am getting very close to the core. Yes or no? I am getting very close to the core itself. 
Now that control center is much more effective because most of the atoms, when the size is very very small, from angstrom to nano it is only 10 to a minus 1 meter different, it becomes more effective but most of the atoms are on the surface so they have the flexibility of interfacing something which is external. I let you digest that concept and I will have a sip of water because I am really on top of my voice. Now to prove this concept, I will have to show some of the nanoparticles. So from kitchen to my lab. Okay. So these are again results from our lab, already published in Journal of Material Science. Uh, so probably you can see the DOI uh, and you can search them. Every scientist has the liability or duty to look into very minute details because science lies in the minutest of details. And, that, and when it comes to nano, you have to be more specific. So what we see here is something like a star shaped structure, okay. but when we saw it very closely, when we got down to the concept of Bundi, each of the Bundi or chickpea, we found that the edges are much more empowered to interact with chemicals as compared to the whole particle. And we couldn't have missed out on these details and given it a real application which was in the field of energy. So what we had to do is, we did a city scan, okay, I'll see if it runs. Now you can understand how each of the, where the inspiration of explaining everything with the Boondi Laddu came to my mind. Every small fraction of this nanoparticle or a nano conglomeration okay, was important for creating an interface because we did a 360 degree CT scan. Right, which normally we do it for human bodies uh, for carrying out a diagnosis. <laughs> back to the drawing room now, from the kitchen to the lab to the drawing room. Now this is an actual uh, image taken from both my kids, one is in uh, class 7, he's a teenager and my daughter who's in class 1, she's about 7 years old. So which one will belong to whom? The parents will know it but what about the kids who played a few years back with Lego? When you were much younger, which of the Lego blocks will give it to you? Something you cannot swallow. The bigger ones. Right? Now tell me which of the blocks will give you more flexibility in terms of creating a shape and size of the same volume? The smaller one. Do we agree with that? Unless you come up with something very radical. So this is another analogy which is given in the book and which I express it in my class also that the smaller the sizes, the more flexibility you gain into creating different shapes and sizes of colors. And this fa fascination of colors is not going to end here. In next few slides you will see how we have used just colors to prove how dispersion is good in nanoscale. <laughs> should I end here, all those who want to sleep, or should I move on? It's a democracy, so I have to ask. Should I move on or it's too hot inside? <coughs> okay, I'll, if, if there are no yes or no, I believe uh, we have something more interesting to show. Now the beauty about nano is uh, there is a lot of symmetry just like nature has. And that is why interfacing nano with nature is even uh, more interesting and more exciting. The images you see right on your left, okay, in this uh, presentation, can you make out what exactly it would be? Some particles, palladium nanoparticles, prepared in the lab. Can you tell me what, what do they look like? 
something in real life. Louder. Somebody, even if you're wrong, that's fine. What do they look like? Do they look like puzzles? Pieces of a puzzle which you juxtapose to build something useful. <laughs> we did that when we were in class or kindergarten or nursery. Now this is a very important concept in surfaces and interface, we call it lock and key. Right? So naturally you can build nanoparticles which have a lock and key mechanism. And not only we, we are dealing with building blocks, but we are also talking about something which can interface, tighten it, and also make something useful. And that is what we do in all the buildings. We put bricks together, lock them with the help of a cement, and create structures. Do we do that? Then only you come up something useful. Individual brick is worth nothing. What will you do with a brick? Nothing. Unless you are able to build a wall, and then finally a building. So based on this, we can do that. The second image or the middle image, what does it show you? What does it show you? And that is the reason why I said most of you should be in the front, but now you have to strain your eyes and, and tell me what exactly it looks like. Had I been a boring teacher, I would have got this in my class, frying right in my face. And this is what it looks like. Does it have any similarity to this paper plate? A lot of similarity. So this means you can actually have flying nanoparticles and that is what we have done. We have made it dance to our tunes and we have made these structures. And the ring you see right at the bottom is actually one such formation. <coughs> and remember, this is without any micro mechanical force. <coughs> any micro <coughs> mechanical force, you're able to make nanoparticles or nanostructures or formations dance to your tunes. What else do you want? Any questions till now? I don't have many slides, so yes. Nothing. It's all supramolecular, all by itself. So it's during the drying process. Yes, during the drying process. And why I say that is nanoparticles by nature are not stiff. In order to stabilize it, they will have to make formations like these. Until date, we have not been able to find an application for it. So these are unpublished, unused results. But just for your information, how beautiful nano can be, we are trying to show it. Because these are palladium nanoparticles, or palladium nanostructures. <coughs> so sometimes what happens uh, by serendipity, or by accident, you create things, but you don't become a Eureka scientist and say, oh, this is like what I found, unless I am able to take it to the real life application. Okay, but just for the purpose of uh, inquisitiveness, or probably these structures in, can intrigue you, and probably you, tomorrow you come and join my group and work on it. Okay, so these are the formations you can make. So we call it a circus ring <coughs> morphology. This happens in a circus <coughs> ring when you put all animals in a definite shape. Now we come to application because of this. And uh, now I'll try to reinforce the statement how we have used nature and nanotechnology interface to produce something useful. So in uh, chemical engineering, uh, we have something called oxygen reduction reaction. It is also there in chemistry and other branches, uh, used in a lot of fuel cells and solar cells. So we have done an organic functionalization of carbon nanofibers with a neem extract. Simple neem, nothing else. The purpose was to have a metal-free <coughs> doping of carbon nanomaterials because if you put metals, there are a lot of issues with it. 
a lot of issues associated with metal dopants. So just by putting a neem extract, if you're able to enhance the oxygen reduction reaction, well and good. If you're able to take it very close to platinum, which is a noble metal, then for your fuel cells, it becomes very, very important and most of your energy <coughs> problems will be solved. One, one aspect which we published and is there in the uh, journals. This was recently published, so I put the reference also. Another aspect in healthcare. I'm showing this because how symmetry can lead to diverse applications and because you work on the intersection, intersection of physics, chemistry, biology, engineering, mathematics also and even computer science, how will you produce anything interfacing nature and nanotechnology? So we use one of the peptides with graphene oxide or graphitic structure. And we found that because of uh, shapes which are able to create an incision, you can create antimicrobial structures. So let me show you slide after this, which shows the clinical application of this particular peptide. A, a lot of time the MIC, minimum inhibition and MDR, a multi-drug resistance, is a major challenge in most of the applications. So we have tried to counter it by uh, coating the needles in the hospital. So what happens when we go to the hospital, and this has happened in COVID also, you go to the hospital to get yourself treated and you end up getting more infections. Why? Because the, the kind of footfall we have hospitals in India is nowhere in the world. The number of patients which come to OPD is sometimes thousand times more than any other country in Europe because our population is such. But what should we do? We have to cater to people. So one way to reduce infection is to have an interface of organic and inorganic structures and look into the cell death of something which is against the proliferation of health. Do you understand that? I'm trying to be, I'm using very simple words because I understand there will be undergrads and postgrads and across. So I'm not using uh, complex terminologies. Uh, but in this diagram, you can actually see there is something called a biofilm. And this is a major concept. The Bhatnagar Award for Biological Sciences was given to one, one such gentleman who talked about tuberculosis and the concept of biofilm. Why TB cannot be treated in 7 days or, or 31 days or 3 months or <coughs> 1 year. It takes years to treat TB because of this formation of a biofilm, which we cannot rupture. And because of that, TB is such a prevalent disease. And it's startling to know that all of us sitting here may have some percentage of TB within us. The only thing is that we are still healthy, we are able to counter it. But millions of people die because of TB every year, in some form or the other. So the issue is the formation of a biofilm, or we call it a boundary, and we are not able to rupture it over a period of time. So we, we thought of doing this for a smaller concept, not TB as yet. We use a graphene with a peptide, antimicrobial, a known peptide, and we wanted to counter the MDR, multi-drug resistance and other bacteria. And we were able to reduce it. The formation of the colony was much lower, almost a one-fourth or a little less than half in some cases as compared to other formulations. So just say one question. Yeah, sure. These needles you are saying that you have put it in needles. Yes, so, so those uh, needles the are from the, 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 the Gisbohan syringes which come when totally covered in medical shops. Yeah, so we, we have done it uh, purposefully. Okay. Infected. Do you see that? And the bacteria, On the left is the bacteria for the pseudomonas or the Yes, yeah. So we have infected it purposefully mm -hmm. and then uh, showed out the setup. We have to simulate the condition. To mimic the... To mimic the... To simulate the condition. <laughs> That's right. And after staining, we found that the colony formation was much less. So this is also published recently. Uh, in fact, this came online in February itself. So this is the latest publication. Flat M is the journal. Yes.
So how is graphene uh, embedded on that? Means graphene embedded. Is, uh, yeah. Means well, it, it has different functional groups. So my question is, with which functional groups the reaction happens? So it is the graphene oxide. Yeah. And your peptide has all the elements which can latch on to oxygen. Okay, so that moiety can attach and then you can have this, this kind of formation. The nanostructure looks something like, uh, like a plain field with some orbs on it. Okay. Maybe if I have that image I can... Or you can refer to this publication, you'll be able to see all the atomic force microscopy and other things. Okay, let's come on to something which is much lighter and I said uh, because we work on the intersection of even using AI uh, to build up some applications. Now nano cannot be interesting unless you are able to build something much hierarchical in structure. This is the first statement I gave you, something you cannot see and you cannot make a product, what is the use? Some small lab results will not make nanotechnology or nanostructures or interfaces or even surfaces exciting. Cosmetically or artistically, it can if you want to put it in a museum as a display, but we have to realize how these functions will work in, at the industrial scale. So we have to think about making formulations, whether it is for food process industry or for pharmacy or any other uh, application where you can actual, actually make a product. So we have put AI to work and in this image on your left, you will see something very peculiar. It is called the third eye. How can you perceive something which is small, but you want to see it in real life? You cannot expect somebody on a shop floor to come back and create or do an atomic force microscope. Is it possible? Not possible. <laughs> Every time you cannot take a sample and say, I want to stop my production in the industry. So the industry, when it comes to us, say, sorry, it is good for lab, it is good for producing a lot of papers, but it will not translate to real life. And that question falls flat in my face and I have to come up with something which is more practical. So we came up with this concept of just clicking images with a mobile phone, a simple mobile phone. And processing those images to understand how dispersion will take place. Right? And how dispersion at nano scale can be evaluated and guessed based on a simple mobile phone image because the mobile cameras are much more stronger than your actual cameras nowadays. Okay, so this uh, information is given in this Journal of Dispersion Science and Technology, also published in 2023. And this is just by mixing two kinds of colors we created a proxy. One is an oil based color and another one is a water based color. And we know oil and water make an emulsion. So these are my undergrad students who are doing this experiment. They wanted to do something meaningful in order to gain admission in a foreign university. Right? So I gave them a very small experiment and they were in a hurry. They had to prepare for their GRE and apply by October. That is the date when they start applying. So to do any other research will take about few years. But this was a small experiment which we did, evaluated by use of a common AI tool and we came up with this hypothesis which we tried to prove. Okay, so this is the in uh, that particular journal. And we have applied it to uh, using in atomic, uh, in automotive coatings, that is real life coatings. Now we all understand that uh, we are having cell driven cars in the market very soon. Already a lot of companies uh, Microsoft, Google, they are venturing into it. And this gentle by, gentleman by the name of Elon Musk, right? Tesla, who's doing a lot of work based on this. But we thought nobody's thinking about surface coatings. You'll make a car very smart, you'll put a lot of AI, but what will happen to the surface coatings? Will they remain the same? Will they remain obsolete? Because these cars are subject to a lot of damage from outside if you are able to manipulate the software. If you are able to hack into the software, 
it can become very very dangerous so neither the prime minister of india nor the president of us or any other personality will use such a car which is safe from yeah from such a hack right so we are thinking of uh, coming up with coatings which are able to read this danger so something has to be imbibed and hidden that's called a stealth technology and we have already worked a lot into automotive coatings this is actually a surface of an automotive coating at nano scale so if you have this kind of an understanding you can really create that interface between humans and that coating okay so this is another concept we are working it may take 50 years 100 years i don't know not in my lifetime but somebody will do it someday okay but just to inspire uh, the students who are much here much longer to stay finally i have my gratitude in terms of uh, you know putting all my thoughts in this book which i am displaying it here because now it has been released and uh, if you happen to get a copy uh, in your library or it is even uh, available online on subscription you will be able to read chapters individually and look into analogies okay so all these thoughts have been put there and uh, my gratitude goes to my most uh, beautiful people in the lab who do all the work with me right and this is uh, our university punjab university this is a research group this is now much bigger okay but this image is so beautiful i cannot discard it right but most of the work done i have shown in the slides has been done by uh, these boys and girls and i am right at their back just backing them up. so thank you very much and uh, i hope uh, it was just about 1 hour or a little less so exactly 1 hour uh, see if you ask a teacher to say us or speak a few words he will not stop before 1 hour because that is a mandate of teaching a class but thank you very much and it was lovely interfacing but i'll be open to questions thank you Yes, right. You showed like the nanoparticles got uh, circular disc. How did you make them form the circular disc? Uh, circular disc. Which one? The dancing circular disc. Yes. <laughs> so that is what I was telling him, and here, uh, you know, the teacher, the faculty colleague asked this also. There is something called. Uh, see, nature doesn't require any driving force. It happens on its own. <laughs> But the driving forces are there in the background. You understand? Just like. the driving force behind a lab is usually the mentor right i may not go and do an experiment all by myself but my students do it but we have a discussion we have a group presentation and they'll execute it but because i'm here what they are doing at the lab i have to trust them so similar these kind of forces work even in nature when you go down to the building blocks it happens naturally and i told you this is the minimum minimum energy level or stable structure they want to come in okay and i made a statement god must be a nanotechnologist any other question i never wondered my voice was so sweet that it could make anybody sleep except my daughter <laughs> yeah, she was a baby knowledge uh, i want to know one thing yes. so i do little bit work with nanoparticles my collaborator is using and i do the biology okay So I have seen there are lots of green synthesis of the metallic <coughs> nanoparticles. Lot, lot of uh, green synthesis of the metallic nanoparticles. Yes. But hmm. whatever I have understood that if the plants have a reducing potential, uh, then the nanoparticle can be synthesized. Right. Okay. So I myself has worked with lipid nanoparticles. Hmm. Lipid nanoparticles because they have some advantage over toxicity okay. compared to the metallic nanoparticles. <coughs> I really have found very very lesser reports about the green synthesis of the lipid nanoparticles. <coughs> so. Is it not possible, or people don't venture on that? Don't. <coughs> uh, I may not be the best person to answer it, uh, but as as far as I believe, uh, we also collaborate with the Department of Pharmacy for a lot of work. But my colleagues in pharmacy do tell me that we tried a lot of application with lipids. A uh, few became successful, even for cancer. They wanted to do it, but they couldn't move forward. Yes, I myself has done. I have done. I have also patented on that. But yeah. actually, synthesis part, I, for my knowledge, that whether you can. But you want nature derived lipids? Yes, yes. So hmm. whether suppose you have shown that knee. Hmm. Ah, so uh, 
we can get several papers that the green synthesis of metallic nanoparticles with the neem neem yeah. leaves or that's right because it has an excellent radiation potential right but nature derived or green synthesis of lipid nanoparticles they are very very rare because i don't get see the, the structure of lipid is not as simple as this is for other difference or other nature derived things and once you have so many controlling parameters uh, the structure becomes even more complex and to understand and apply it to a particular application becomes uh, a himalayan challenge that that is a, one of the reasons which i understand but i'll stick still look into more things and maybe email it back right uh, we have not ventured into that side okay but uh, one of the applications which uh, we are working in uh, the recent results have been very promising is reducing the size of tumor using totally nature derived extracts no drugs at all and uh, we have done some animal studies and come up with some good results but when you work with human tissues it's it's not that straight forward yes you have to repeat it maybe 100 times but biopolymer is the problem yes so in one of the slides you have shown us uh, all the nano particles with different shapes but you could not find out any application for that yes so regarding that i would like to say something that uh, we also uh, try to synthesize uh, metal nano particles with different shape and size mm -hmm. and we tested it on a multi drug resistant bacteria where effluxing mechanism is there effluxing is something it's a pumping mechanism which is present in all the multi drug resistant bacteria if we put antibiotic it will pump out so we try to you know block that effluxing mechanism by using uh, nanoparticles with different shape and size okay and uh, bacteria you want to plug the yes 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 gaps yes so uh, we try to do it and we found that uh, different shape and size uh, these bacteria they respond differently so based on that we published a very good paper in applied nanoscience right the paper is uh, uh, already there what and so uh, it was a msc dissertation work on it okay. but it got published in a very good journal applied nanoscience i think the impact factor was that time 3.8 or 4 approximately so if you can provide us those uh, nano particles with, with different shapes but, but they are palladium Yeah, the, the issue is, uh, but uh, the metal nano particles have a different kind of. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that is true. What and I'm the challenge with nature is, and the challenge with uh, uh, living species is, mm -hmm. it's evolution. It's evolving. Yes. Sir. And when it's evolving, it knows how to work its way around whatever you want to try to apply. If it is automotive coatings, I know it's it's not dynamic. It doesn't have that time changing mm -hmm. factor. Okay. It, it is straightforward, but we want even the automotive coatings to be living, and that is what I said. We want to make it smarter, artificially intelligent, so that when somebody or something is approaching, which is dangerous to the inhabitants inside the car, it should start thinking and do something else. Right. So the main challenge with uh, nature and nanotechnology is that you want to make nano smarter than nature, which is a, a big ask. nature always know how how to adapt and how to evolve into something new and that that is what happens with our bacteria that is what happened with covid in recent times see the kind of uh, uh, ramifications it had you produce a vaccine now it's, it has so many variants and we don't know how to deal with it delta and so many other new species are coming up china is trying to subdue the data but we know what's happening probably in china nowadays every now and then there's something which is happening as a lockdown so that's the challenge we still have a very little understanding of nature we know how to destroy it but when it hits back we are not able to handle it right yeah any other question so just a outset question uh, you threw in some extra light on the fact that you're trying to block this signaling of uh, See again, we'll have to go back to nature for inspiration. We call it biomimicry, right? Uh, nature has its own mechanism of camouflaging, camouflaging, or uh, adapting to the background. This happens in, in so many species. You see in a chameleon, or so many lizards, and so many other species, or so many insects. So we want to have similar thoughts. Kind of cloaking the vehicle from. 
could be one of these strategies, one of the strategies. Another could be electromagnetic blocking. Yeah. Now it is device based, it is totally based on a device. But if you have an embedded device which cannot be seen, you cannot destroy it. As simple as that. That is the point. And this has even further application. Suppose you want this room, suppose you have a sunny day, not a cloudy day. You don't want light from inside, you want reflection from <coughs> outside. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, <coughs> so can you have mirrors which can change its optical properties or the buildings which can change its uh, outer layer? See, these are all futuristic things. We, we see it in sci-fi movies, but when it comes to application, it will take another decade or maybe few decades. <coughs> Your institute fed me to Puri's right in the morning and that's why. <laughs> yeah. That's all. Right, so I invite you to be a part of our, our research group and maybe in terms of collaboration or doing a, a PhD or a postdoc or in any other form. And I've already extended my invitation to the faculty members here. Thank you so much uh, for the honor of hosting. Thank you.